but on the other hand, I did not want to be too far away from Midway the next morning. I wished to have a position from which either to follow up retreating enemy forces or break up a landing in Midway. Once he had recovered the last strike planes, the American task force withdrew east until midnight, when they reversed course to bring them back within striking distance of threatened Midway at dawn. Although he faced later criticism for giving up the pursuit, Spruance's tactical judgment proved absolutely correct. Had he continued westward, he would certainly have run into the trap that Yamamoto set and, with his carriers unable to operate their planes at night, would have fallen easy prey to the guns of Kondo's battleships and Kurita's heavy cruisers. After an anxious wait until midnight for word that the enemy force had been contacted, Yamamoto faced the downfall of his plan for luring the Americans into a night action. He and his staff now had to worry about the massacre that would occur if dawn caught them too near Midway's aircraft or strikes from the returning enemy carriers. The advice of some of his staff was that the atoll should be bombarded and captured as a face-saving operation, but Admiral Ugaki dismissed such an option. Our battleships, for all their firepower, would be destroyed by enemy air and submarine attacks before we could even get close enough to use our big guns. The capture of Midway would have to be postponed. But even if that proves impossible, and we must accept defeat in this operation, we will not have lost the war. There will still be eight carriers in the fleet, counting those which are to be completed soon. In battle, as in chess, it is the fool who lets himself be led into a reckless move through desperation. Not all his staff were prepared to accept Ugaki's hard-faced analysis. Some asked, how are we going to apologise to His Majesty for this defeat? Their commander-in-chief, who had maintained silent counsel, now made it clear he would swallow that most bitter of pills. Leave that to me, Yamamoto interrupted. I am the only one who must apologise to His Majesty. Midway operation is cancelled, was flashed out at midnight from the combined fleet flagship. By abandoning the plan, Yamamoto not only accepted defeat, but also resigned himself to the fact that bringing off a war-winning naval victory against the Americans would now be more difficult to achieve. The transports carrying the invasion force turned back for Saipan. Admirals Kondo and Kurita were ordered to join up with Nagumo and rendezvous to the northwest, with the main force to return to Japan. Only the northern units were signalled to go ahead with the planned occupation of the two Aleutian Islands. A few shells from a lone Japanese submarine, defiantly but harmlessly splashing into Midway's lagoon, were a reminder of the combined fleet's awesome gunpower, which had been defeated by the United States Pacific Fleet's carrier aircraft without ever having had a chance to launch a salvo. The night of despair was over for Yamamoto, who promptly retired to his cabin complaining again of stomach pains. The collapse of Operation MI was to tarnish the Imperial Navy's record, its first defeat made more humiliating when two ships in Kurita's cruiser force were later involved in a collision some 90 miles northwest of Midway. After receiving the recall signal, the four heavy cruisers of the Occupation Support Force were steaming across the Pacific at 28 knots when a lookout spotted a submarine. The leading pair swung violently to port, but the stern Marka Mogami did not pick up the signal until too late, ramming into the Mikuma ahead of her. Although he had not had a chance to fire his torpedoes, the skipper of the USS Tamba, before crash-diving to avoid the onrushing destroyers, was delighted to see that one cruiser was aflame at the bows. The Mogami, one of the world's fastest and most powerful cruisers, had its bows wrecked, and Mikuma was badly damaged. Quick work in shoring up their damaged bulkheads enabled them to limp away at twelve knots under heavy escort. The night of June 4 was not without its anxiety for Admiral Nimitz and his staff at Pearl Harbor. News that their task forces had knocked out and set ablaze four Japanese carriers suggested they had victory in their grasp, unless Spruance blundered into a night engagement. Nimitz was certain that he did not have to remind his commander on the spot of the risks such a battle would bring when he sent out a message that evening. You who have participated in the Battle of Midway today have written a glorious page in our history. I am proud to be associated with you. I estimate that another day of all-out effort on your part will complete the defeat of the enemy. The Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet War Diary noted that June 4 had seen the start of what may be the greatest sea battle since Jutland. Its outcome, 
if as unfavourable to the Japanese as seems indicated, will virtually end their expansion. In Washington, the Navy Department was cautiously guarded. Their release to the press on the morning of June 5 indicated that a major naval action was going on in the Pacific, which appeared to be falling in the United States' favour. It is too early to claim a major Japanese disaster. The enemy are continuing to withdraw, but we are continuing the battle. Reading between the lines of official ease, the reporters sensed the growing assurance of the Navy that the outcome would make the biggest headlines since Pearl Harbor. Admiral Spruance, like the Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet Staff, fully expected that the battle would begin afresh the next morning. At dawn, the PBYs were racing off Midway's lagoon to reconnoitre the enemy units. Heavy overcast and low visibility hampered their search operations as Task Force 16 steamed at a safe distance to the northeast off the atoll, while Spruance waited for news of which Japanese force to attack with an airstrike. For the pilots aboard the American carriers, it was a long morning of waiting, an anti-climax to the action they were anticipating. The Marines' remaining dauntlesses and vindicators took off soon after dawn to attack the two crippled cruisers that had been reported by the tambour. The Japanese gunners put up a fierce barrage, which cost an American plane without inflicting any more damage on either the Mogami or the Mikuma. Late that afternoon, when Spruance was convinced from the morning reconnaissance that all enemy heavy units were retreating westward, he launched a strike against the cruisers. Failing to locate them, the American planes dropped their bombs wildly, leaving unscathed a lone destroyer that had been sent to Mogami's assistance. The main action for the United States Navy that anticlimactic day was the battle to save the Yorktown. She had been found at dawn still afloat by the destroyer Hughes, which had come alongside to investigate reports of gunfire. Two wounded sailors who had crawled up from the sickbay where they had been left for dead the previous day had been responsible for the shots. Finding that the fires were out, the Hughes's skipper put a salvage party aboard and radioed for help to save the drifting carrier. When the minesweeper Virio appeared, the two small vessels spent the afternoon struggling to take the huge Yorktown in tow, their efforts hampered by a rising sea. At dusk, the destroyer Hammond arrived with Captain Buckmeister and a volunteer party drawn from his crew. The fight to salvage the dead carrier and counter her flooding compartments went on all night, with the Hammond alongside supplying power to work the pumps. The battle for the drifting Yorktown might have been won, had she not been sighted the previous morning by one of the reconnaissance float planes sent out from Nagumo's retreating cruisers. The nearest Japanese submarine was radioed to sink the carrier, but because of inaccurate reports of the position, took a day and a half to find its quarry. The Yorktown's list had been corrected, and hopes were rising that she might be brought back to Pearl Harbour with the arrival of tugs. But the captain of Imperial Navy Submarine 1168 had finally fixed the carrier in the crosswires of his attack periscope. On the afternoon of June 6, one torpedo hit the Hammon, breaking the destroyer in two and sinking her with heavy loss of life. Others slammed into her bulky charge. For the second time in two days, Buckmeister was forced to abandon ship, although he hoped to get one of the other destroyers alongside to resume salvage operations next morning. Without power to keep the pumps going, the Yorktown that night succumbed to the flooding, capsizing and settling deep in the Pacific. The whole saga of her dismal end, after the glorious fight she had put up at the Coral Sea and Midway, was an indelible lesson to every skipper in the United States Navy not to abandon ship prematurely. While the battle was still going on to save the Yorktown, Admiral Spruance was planning to take advantage of perfect flying weather to resume his pursuit of the enemy, now that it was clear the Japanese had abandoned their efforts to invade Midway and were in full retreat. The old naval maxim that a stern chase is a long one proved to be only too true. Yamamoto had not given up all hope that he might still have a chance of victory, if the American force ventured far enough west to allow the Japanese to operate in conjunction with airstrikes from the planes on Wake Island. But once again, Spruance had second-guessed him by sending out a strike of dive bombers west that morning to locate the two damaged cruisers, which he knew would be trying to reach the protection of the atoll's Japanese base. They located both crippled vessels at mid-morning. They were helpless targets, as easy as shooting ducks in a barrel.
One of the Enterprise pilots radioed in excitement as the Mikuma sank in a mass of flames. Badly mauled and on fire, the Megami still bore a charmed life, managing to limp away and eventually reach the sanctuary of Truk. The pictures that were taken of the two battered cruisers, smoke and flames rearing from their battered turrets, were to be dramatic proof to the American public of the smashing victory won off midway by their Pacific fleet. The triumph was only slightly dimmed by the news that the Japanese had landed without opposition on the most westerly Aleutian island, Atu, to make prisoners of a handful of Aleut Eskimos and the ten members of the weather station. With the simultaneous occupation of uninhabited Kiska, this gave enemy propaganda a chance to inflate the dramatic claim that the rising sun was now flying over the United States mainland. What had been originally intended as the northern outpost of a mid-Pacific defensive perimeter would prove to be a strategic liability without the possession of Midway. The Japanese clung stubbornly to their prize. Nimitz realised that the public would be upset by the fact that the enemy was technically on American shores, and the day after the landings he ordered Task Force 16 to head north to launch strikes against the islands in an attempt to dislodge this embarrassing new outpost of Japan. Spruance was relieved next day to learn from the signal recalling him to Pearl Harbor that Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet had thought better of allowing his carriers to venture where they might be ambushed by battleships and submarines in the foggy northern waters. Yamamoto had been robbed of his last opportunity to salvage something from the defeat, whose catastrophic implications for Japan were soon to become apparent. The transports returned to Saipan with the 5,000 troops wondering what disaster had befallen the invincible Imperial Navy. The action off Midway, which marked the beginning of the end of the Japanese Empire, cost the Imperial Navy not only its undefeated record, but four carriers and a heavy cruiser, the lives of 2,200 sailors, 234 aircraft, and the best of their naval aviation. I felt like swearing, Admiral Ugaki wrote of the defeat, which bore even more heavily on his commander-in-chief. Declaring that it was all his responsibility, and they were not to criticise the Nagumo force, Yamamoto retired to his quarters complaining of stomach cramps, refusing to see any of his staff for three days. Aboard the Nagato, Admiral Nagumo wretchedly blamed himself for the disaster, and had to be persuaded by his staff not to take their own lives. A major effort to cover up the magnitude of their defeat was launched on June 10 by the naval staff in Tokyo, who feared public reaction and a severe loss of face. Heralded by the blaring strains of the Navy march, the radio announcer read a communique that Japan had secured supreme power in the Pacific, and that the war had been determined by one battle in which one Imperial Navy carrier had been sunk to two losses by the United States Navy, along with 120 of their planes. Lantern parades were staged in Tokyo to celebrate this new victory, when four days later the combined fleet made an unheralded return to the Hashirajima anchorage. There were no comments about the absence of four carriers because they were not missed, having been continuously at sea since the war began. The survivors of the Akagi, Kaga, Soryu and Hiryu were hustled off without leave to outlying bases in Japan and the Pacific. The wounded were landed by night and taken to sealed hospital wards, where they were denied visits by their next of kin. The United States Navy was at first circumspect about its victory. On June 6, when it became clear that the Japanese were in retreat, Nimitz radioed a congratulatory signal promising that the Pacific fleet would continue to make the enemy realise that war is hell. His staff celebrated with the Jeroboam of Champagne, dressed up with Admiral's stripes that General Emmons sent to Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet with his compliments, and a promise never to doubt naval intelligence in the future. Nimitz magnanimously sent his car to fetch Commander Rochefort to the party, but he was so long changing from his informal attire into uniform that he arrived after the champagne had run dry. Nimitz nevertheless paid him the tribute before his whole staff. This officer deserves a major share of the credit for the victory at Midway. On June 7, Fleet Admiral King in Washington held his first press conference since being appointed Commander-in-Chief United States Fleet. He allowed that the enemy force have taken some hard knocks. Coming from the flinty admiral, most reporters knew this meant that a sizeable triumph had been chalked up by the United States Navy.
That same morning, the Chicago Tribune headlined, Navy had word of Japan plan to strike at sea. The reporter Stanley Johnson had seen an after-action dispatch from which he was able to deduce the explosive revelation that victory had been made possible by a dramatic intelligence breakthrough. The story raised a storm behind the scenes, with King charging that it endangered the entire Pacific War. The panic blew over, however, when it appeared that Tokyo's intelligence staff apparently did not read American newspapers. The lapse in security was not repeated. All officers throughout the Navy were threatened by personal directive from Commander-in-Chief United States Fleet, with instant court-martial if any such leaks occurred in future. The triumph of the American carriers at Midway was won by the tenacity and secrecy of United States naval intelligence, and by the bravery of individual pilots, as much as by the cool tactical judgments of Admirals Fletcher and Spruance and Admiral Nimitz's bold strategic calculations. It was a battle that was also helped by the Japanese's fatal victory disease. The significance of the United States' triumph was not lost on Admiral King, who wrote, The Battle of Midway was the first decisive defeat suffered by the Japanese Navy in 350 years. Furthermore, it put an end to the long period of Japanese offensive action and restored the balance of naval power in the Pacific. Pearl Harbor has now been partially avenged, Admiral Nimitz's communique of June 6, 1942, announced, Vengeance will not be complete until Japanese sea power is reduced to impotence. The public euphoria over the midway triumph in America was in strong contrast to the bitterness developing between the Army and Navy factions as the debate between them reopened on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Admiral King argued for keeping up the momentum against the Japanese by pressing ahead with the Pacific Fleet's offensive in the Solomons. The Australians wanted an invasion of Timor, where their soldiers along with Dutch troops were waging a guerrilla campaign, but General MacArthur wanted to marshal Allied sea and air strength for a massive assault on Rabaul. General Marshall, who regarded the Midway victory as the closest squeak, was against launching any offensive in the Pacific, because he was convinced that disaster was looming across the Atlantic. It must confess, I view with great concern the Russian front, read President Roosevelt's cable to Churchill on June 6, which informed him that our operations in the Pacific are going well with the news of Midway. The Red Army had been defeated in the Ukraine at Kharkov, and the German offensive was rolling toward the Crimea and the Caucasus. Stalin's foreign minister, Molotov, had flown to London and then Washington to get British and American commitment to a landing on the continent in August or September. Churchill, however, would give no promise. His concern, like that of his military chiefs, was that a hasty cross-channel assault in 1942 to relieve pressure on Russia would be a sacrificial landing, and he had carefully made it conditional upon the availability of troops and transports. The Prime Minister knew that this was in fact unlikely. Britain's Eighth Army had had to fall back on Tobruk after a massive defeat inflicted by Rommel that cost hundreds of tanks and thousands of casualties. Troops on their way to India were now being diverted to meet the danger to the Suez Canal. Nearly million tons of merchant tonnage had been lost to the U-boat blitz still raging in American waters, and the severe shipping crisis put a vice-like grip on any extension of strategic operations. Until the ambitious American liberty ship building program could mass-produce vessels faster than the enemy could sink them, priority had to be given to maintaining the Atlantic lifeline. To resolve the crisis that was again threatening Allied strategy, Churchill proposed another conference. From his daily telephone discussions with the Prime Minister, the President was keenly aware of the impending disaster overtaking the British in the Mediterranean. The United States Joint Chiefs were alarmed that Roosevelt might jump the traces and support launching the Second Front not in Europe but in North Africa. On June 17, while Churchill's flying boat was droning across the North Atlantic, the British Chiefs of Staff's blunt memorandum advising against any such operation was being read by Roosevelt at Hyde Park. Next day, while they were still adamantly insisting to the United States Chiefs that there should be no substantial landing in France this year, the Prime Minister flew down to the President's Hudson Valley estate for a personal summit, during which he sought support for his alternative Second Front strategy. On June 20, the two leaders took one of history's momentous decisions – 
to pool national efforts and pay whatever price was necessary to develop the atomic bomb. As Churchill recorded that the Allies could not run the mortal risk of being outstripped in this awful sphere. Scientists working for the top-secret British Tube Alloys project had already shown that such a terrible weapon was theoretically feasible, but only the United States, whose own scientific team was working on the problem too, had the colossal industrial and financial resources to make the bomb. Within two months, the multi-billion dollar technological effort disguised by the cover name Manhattan Engineer District was being set up under the control of the United States Army with access to unlimited secret funding. Next day, the President and the Prime Minister arrived back in Washington to find the unresolved debate on the 1942 Second Front strategy, overshadowed by news that the fortress of Tobruk had been captured. It was feared that the German Second Army might burst through the Caucasus to link up with the Africa Corps, advancing across Palestine on the plains of Armageddon. To aid in countering Rommel's offensive, which imperiled the Middle East, the President unhesitatingly offered to send tanks, guns and ammunition by sea. Shell fuses and medical supplies were to be flown in by a new air route across Africa. To assist the defence of Egypt, he even promised a United States armoured division if it was needed. Forty-eight hours later, when Churchill began his long flight back across the Atlantic to take personal charge of the crisis and face another vote of censure by Parliament, the issue of the cross-channel attack was still unresolved. However, it was already plain that the need to rush emergency convoys out to the Middle East would severely curtail major operations in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. July would bring no respite to the hard-pressed British army in North Africa as Rommel's panzers pressed on to El Alamein, and in Russia General von Bock's army south overran the Crimea and prepared for the drive onto Rostov and Stalingrad. The tide of German victories brought renewed fears that Japan had decided now was the time, with the Red Army on the brink of defeat, to launch an attack in Siberia. Magic intercepts of the Berlin-Tokyo circuit and the flow of traffic from Japanese consulates in South America all pointed to an imminent widening of her war effort. The President worried that this might be the final blow that would push the Soviet Union into defeat, but Washington's fears were allayed to a degree by the report of Military Intelligence Service's Special Branch, which reviewed the evidence and concluded that the diplomatic offensive was a plot that had all the hallmarks of a wily Oriental mind. It soon proved accurate and was the first major contribution to the secret intelligence war made by the work of the unit established under Colonel Alfred McCormick. An outstanding member of the New York Bar, he was appointed a special assistant to the Secretary of War, with the task of recruiting a team of experts to make the kind of overall assessment and interpretation of magic intelligence that might have saved the United States from the Pearl Harbor debacle. Drawing on some of the best legal brains under the leadership of Carter W. Clark, who was appointed colonel in command of the Special Service Branch, they organised the critical and interpretative assessment of the mass of intelligence material along the lines established by the British teams, who were evaluating German Enigma traffic for the Ultra operation. It was therefore ironic that the evaluation and application of intelligence had just been fumbled by the Royal Navy, where the likely movements of the Tirpitz were concerned. Anticipation that Hitler's biggest battleship was about to attack had led to the decision to scatter the PQ-17 convoy ploughing north toward Russia during the first days of July. She remained in the Norwegian fjords as the helpless merchantmen were bombed and torpedoed by the Luftwaffe and U-boats. The Admiralty decided to call off any further attempts to ship the badly needed aid to the Soviet Union. Stalin angrily protested, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington began to believe that the Red Army might only be saved from defeat by an immediate diversionary attack on France. Churchill firmly ruled out any such precipitate action in his July 8 cable to Roosevelt. His excuse that there were just no resources with which the British Army could carry out the sledgehammer assault plan left the United States Army Chief of Staff so stirred up that he took the unusual step of presenting a joint memorandum with Commander-in-Chief United States Fleet that advised the President that he should insist on the British honouring their obligations or we should turn to the Pacific and strike decisively at Japan.
the ploy to threaten Churchill with a strategic about-face in the direction of the Allied war effort was Marshall's own idea. But 15 years later, he would suggest that in my case it was a bluff, but King wanted the alternative. However, it was immediately called by Roosevelt himself during a strained and stormy meeting in the White House on July 12, 1942. During the two-hour session with his chiefs of staff, the President let it be known that he was favouring sending troops to North Africa to help the British and also satisfy his own political need to get a major part of the three million United States Army troops into action before the end of the year. Marshall and King flew to London for a tough bargaining session. They found the British immovably against the sledgehammer, cross-channel operations, and in a discussion that Churchill termed strategic natural selection, they were left no choice but to agree to the gymnast operation. Rechristened Torch, it called for the United States Army to invade North Africa that autumn, while the assault on the European mainland was postponed. The British agreed only to a token raid on Dieppe to placate the Russians. The Prime Minister said he would undertake a risky mission to Moscow, like carrying a large lump of ice to the North Pole, to explain personally to Stalin why there would be no second front in 1942. Once again, the crisis over Allied strategy had been resolved by the President holding firmly to his Europe-first doctrine. The defeat of Germany means the defeat of Japan, probably without even firing a shot, he insisted. Marshall took a less sanguine view, yet he too had held the same belief, although he resented being manoeuvred by the British into committing American forces to the indirect route to Berlin via North Africa. The United States Army Chief had realised there was no alternative for 1942 if he was to get his divisions into the land campaign. Switching to the Pacific would have given no chance to come to grips with the Japanese in battles that would have to be fought out on tropical islands and jungle peninsulas, and he had already decided that this must primarily be an amphibious war. Admiral King was now vociferously pressing for his offensive against Japan, a campaign Congress also clamoured for. Its first objective would be to hurl the Japanese out of the Aleutians. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, however, relegated this mission to the bottom of their strategic priorities. Admiral Theobald's small task force could be relied upon to blockade and raid the strategically insignificant enemy toeholds on the bleak islands of Kiska and Atu. The Army Air Force, with the aid of the civil airlines, would then open up an air supply route through some of the world's most hostile flying conditions, along which troops and supplies could be mustered for an eventual offensive down the Aleutians. With Midway now secure, the strategic focus in the Pacific shifted back to New Guinea and the Solomons, where the enemy was still able to threaten Australia. While the Southwest Pacific was primarily General MacArthur's area of operations, he began his bid to win control of the entire Pacific theatre by demanding a Marine Division and two carrier task forces to carry out a grandly conceived offensive named Tulsa. The operation was intended to take Rabul in two weeks, forcing the enemy back 700 miles to his base at Truk. King's opinion of the general as little short of megalomaniacal had been coloured by Admiral Hart's unflattering and highly charged personal report on his role in bringing about the disaster in the Philippines. In any event, the autocratic admiral was not about to hand over control of the few precious carriers in the Pacific. He wanted them to play a vital role in launching his own offensive drive north up into the Solomons, which he believed could take Rabaul in a month. His insistence that such operations were of a primarily naval and amphibious character, and therefore properly subject to the control of Admiral Nimitz, effectively prevented MacArthur from launching an offensive of any scale. The general's strident protest that this was another move by the Navy cabal to assume general command of all operations in the Pacific theatre brought Marshall into a direct confrontation with the chief of naval operations. For two weeks, a fierce battle was fought between the Army and Navy chiefs over who was going to run the Pacific War. A heated exchange of memoranda was fired back and forth, and King threatened to go ahead with his offensive independently of Army consent. To heal the breach, on July 26, Marshall agreed to a compromise that the Navy had proposed earlier. A decision was reached with great difficulty a week later, and a directive issued on July 2, 1942, which laid down the objectives for the first stages of the limited United States offensive against Japan. Admiral Nimitz was to be in overall command of Task 1, 
The capture of the Santa Cruz Islands as a preliminary to attacking the Japanese's mid-Solomons base at Tulagi, opposite Guadalcanal Island, by August 1. General MacArthur was to begin Task 2, a parallel drive to oust the Japanese from New Guinea, preparatory to launching Task 3, the invasion of New Britain and the capture of Rabul. To avert a dispute between MacArthur and Nimitz's South Pacific Area Commander, Admiral Gormley, the Joint Chiefs neatly shifted the Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet boundary westward of Guadalcanal to bring the Lower Solomons under Navy control. The stage was now set for Task 1, which had been prophetically codenamed Operation Watchtower, in deference to King's intention that it should be the curtain-raiser to the Navy's Pacific campaign. On July 3, the Commander-in-Chief United States Fleet Staff flew to San Francisco to outline the plan to Admiral Nimitz. They found him badly shaken by a narrow brush with death when the flying boat bringing him from Pearl Harbor capsized on landing, killing the pilot. On Independence Day, the United States Navy brass assembled in the Federal Building to hear Rear Admiral Richmond Kelly Turner outline the operation. Fiercely outspoken, Turner was a brilliant tactician who had been head of the Navy's War Plans Division until February, when his evident partisanship had made it impossible for him to work alongside the Army planners. Then King had appointed him Commander of Amphibious Forces in the South Pacific under Admiral Gormley, who was not at the briefing because he had been sent to Melbourne to mend the Navy's fences and secure the cooperation of MacArthur. Optimism infused the conference. Despite the losses of two American carriers at Coral Sea and Midway, the Japanese had sacrificed their main strike force, while Nimitz could form four task forces around the Saratoga, Enterprise, Hornet and Wasp, as well as the first of the newly commissioned class of fast battleships, the North Carolina. Admiral King believed that with the early capture of Rabaul, he might yet carry the naval offensive to Truk, Guam and Saipan, smashing Japan's Pacific defence perimeter and opening up the home islands to attack. But his fervour was cooled by intelligence from Rochefort's hypo team at Pearl Harbour, which by now had begun to penetrate the new version of the Japanese Navy 25 code, revealing that an airfield was being hurriedly constructed on Guadalcanal. Once completed, it would not only allow Japan to make a renewed bid for air superiority over the Coral Sea, but also close the sea approaches to eastern Australia and threaten Fiji and Noumea. King at once ordered a revision of Operation Watchtower, dropping the requirement for establishing advance bases in the Santa Cruz Islands. Instead, it called for simultaneous invasions of Tulagi and Guadalcanal. This new urgency caused him to reject MacArthur's call for postponing the August 1 deadline, made after his meeting with Admiral Gormley. Three weeks ago, MacArthur stated that if he could be provided with amphibious forces and two carriers, he could push right through to Rabul, King testily informed Marshall. He now feels that he not only cannot undertake the extended operation, but even the Tulagi operations. While the American strategy was focusing on the Solomons, the defeat at Midway had forced the Imperial General Staff in Tokyo to recast their second operational phase objectives in the Pacific. The combined fleet was still very much the superior of the United States Pacific Fleet in battleships, cruisers and destroyers. Notwithstanding, the loss to Nagumo's carrier force of highly trained airstriking crews, along with the four carriers, had been a serious setback to the naval staff's plans. They were obliged to abandon their second operational phase assault on Samoa, through which they would have menaced Australia. Now the Japanese army won their demand for a defensive strategy, directed at establishing interlocking airbases and fortified islands to make a secure perimeter against the launching of Allied attacks. Ocean and Nauru were to be belatedly seized to secure the southern approaches to the Marshall and Gilbert Islands, and priority was to be given to completing the occupation of New Guinea. On June 12, a new directive appointed Lieutenant General Harukichi Hayakutake, the younger brother of the Emperor's Grand Chamberlain, to take command of the Imperial 17th Army Division at Rabul. He was ordered to succeed where Admiral Inouye had repeatedly failed by executing Operation R.I. to win control of the Papuan Peninsula. No longer able to count on strong naval support, the Army staff decided that this had to be accomplished by landings at Buna and Gona on the north coast, then marching troops across the Owen Stanley mountain trails to capture Port Moresby.
Vice Admiral Gunichi Mikawa, commanding the Navy's Leth Air Fleet, and the newly established 8th Fleet of cruisers and destroyers based at Rabaul, would provide air support to New Guinea and the base in Guadalcanal to secure the Solomon Islands. The Imperial General Headquarters and General Hayakutake's staff were almost two weeks ahead of the Allies, who were also planning to seize the same strategic objectives. As a first requirement to fulfilling Task 2 of the United States Joint Chiefs Directive of July 2, General MacArthur had decided to secure the Papuan Peninsula by striking at the Japanese-held ports of Ley and Salamaua to the north by setting up an advance base and airfield at Buna. On July 10, a six-man team surveyed the coastal site at the northern end of the tortuous Kokoda Trail, which wound a precipitous 100-mile route over the Owen Stanley Mountains from Port Moresby. Planning was in full swing for Operation Providence, to send 3,000 Australian troops over the jungle-choked mountain pass to reinforce the local militia and open an airstrip by August 10. The Japanese, however, were swifter. The crack South Seas detachment of Major General Tomitaro Harii was already aboard transports heading for Buna and Gona as the launching base for a mountain march across Papua. On July 18, Australian reconnaissance planes reported that this transport convoy was putting out from Rabul. There was no time now to rush Operation Providence into action. General Brett ordered his B-17 bombers out from their northern Australian base at Townsville, but operating at extreme range, the Flying Fortress bombers failed to disrupt the landings, which took Buna on July 22. Within days, 13,000 Japanese soldiers and 1,000 native bearers were able to extend their beachhead north to Gona, to begin the push south over the mountainous spine of Papua. A few hundred native militiamen and an advance company of the 29th Australian Infantry were all that stood between the enemy and the strategically vital airstrip at Kokoda, 50 miles inland, up in the foothills of the Quen Stanleys. From here the mountain trail wound up over 10,000 punishing feet, crossing steep jungle-choked ravines. Neither Major Basil Morris, the Australian commander at Kokoda, nor anyone at MacArthur's headquarters realised at first that the Japanese would attempt to fight troops across such a formidable natural barrier. They had not reckoned with the determination of General Horai, who had sent up an advance party from the 41st Infantry Regiment to use its jungle fighting skills, acquired in Malaya to sweep through to Kokoda. Every one of the 2,000 soldiers was trained to hack his way through the undergrowth with a machete until he dropped with exhaustion. When a man fell, his place would be taken by another. Each soldier was equipped with a special shovel with holes, so that mud would not stick to the blade. This soon proved an invaluable weapon in a campaign where perpetual rain and mist drenched the jungle, turning the steep trail into a slippery morass. Field and machine guns were stripped down to be carried by native bearers, as the mountain trail was hacked open so that the South Seas detachment following behind could make one of the most gruelling military advances in history, over the Owen Stanley Ridge and down into Port Moresby. Too late, Lieutenant Colonel William Owen, the Australian commander, perceived that the Japanese meant to pull off the impossible. By that time, his 500 infantrymen and the Papuan militia had retreated across the swaying suspension wire rope bridge that the natives called in pidgin English Waropi. Its cables had to be cut to drop it down into the raging torrents of the Kumasi River, but the enemy rapidly threw across their own bridge, and by July 29, Owen had lost his life in the pitched battle for Kokoda. Desperate counterattacks succeeded in recapturing the vital airfield for a week. When this was lost again, the only way for reinforcements to reach the defenders was along the Kokoda Trail, up which the Australians now retreated, pursued by chanting Japanese who kept up a constant deluge of mortar and rifle fire that was as persistent and demoralising as the torrential rains. Horii's troops bypassed the few positions the Australians managed to hold by cutting their way up jungle-covered slopes like demonic ants to harry the head of the retreating column. Mid-August brought the Japanese over halfway to their objective as the fighting wound up to the steepest part of the trail, called aptly the Gap. The blazing sun and thin air increased the misery of the ordeal. The road gets gradually steeper, recorded one of Horii's soldiers. The sun is fierce here. We make our way through a jungle where there are no roads, 
The jungle is beyond description. Thirst for water, stomach empty. Worn out by strenuous fighting and exhausting movement, and weakened by lack of food, sleep and shelter, many of them had come to a standstill, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Honor noted of the pitiful condition of the surviving Australian troops in August, when he arrived to take command of the defence of the Gap. T led one lost cause, and am trying desperately not to have it. Two, MacArthur wrote as the Australian High Command, anticipating the loss of New Guinea and an invasion, began discussing a withdrawal to hold the Brisbane line. Threatening to resign as Commander-in-Chief unless such defeatist talk stopped at once, MacArthur deliberately moved his headquarters north to Brisbane's AMP Insurance Building, whose staff had been evacuated to Sydney. We'll defend Australia in New Guinea, he announced, after he had moved his wife and son into the dusty town's Lennon Hotel. The 7th Australian Division was already being shipped into Papua. The tough soldiers, bloodied in the desert fighting in North Africa, were to face an even sterner task in Papua, where the jungle was to prove as tenacious an enemy as the Japanese. But MacArthur was resolute. We must attack, 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 he told the press, in a masterful theatrical address heavily larded with quotes from Plato and Lincoln. It sounded better as rhetoric than tactics, but he nevertheless received the unstinting support of General Sir Thomas Blamey. The Allied Ground Forces commander, a former chief of the Melbourne police, had become a popular hero with his countrymen after returning from the Middle East. A successful leader of the hard-drinking, hard-fighting troops, he drew considerable support from his capable deputy, Major General George Vasey. The arrival of General George C. Kenney to take over as Southwest Pacific Forces Air Commander from General Brett injected a needed dose of bustling aggressiveness into MacArthur's Brisbane staff. Stocky and gregarious, in contrast to the Commander-in-Chief, the two men quickly became good partners after an initial coolness that was broken when Kenny's brisk methods shook up the Army and Royal Australian Air Force squadrons, whose cooperation had deteriorated into a can of worms. Setting out on a tour of the scattered bases, Kenny was the most senior officer so far to visit New Guinea. There he shared the discomforts of Port Moresby, where lack of mosquito netting and a poor diet of canned M and V, canned meat and vegetables, encouraged the spread of malaria and endemic dysentery in the savage, dusty heat. Kinney learned that his flyers expected to lose £30 in a single duty tour. They joked about the New Guinea salute, the constant gesture of brushing away swarms of black flies. The men were plagued by mosquitoes so big that the standing joke was that ground crews rushed out to refuel them at night, mistaking them for aircraft in the dark. Kenny also learned that apart from morale, MacArthur's opinion that the aircrew were a rabble of boulevard shock troops whose contribution to the war effort was practically nil was more than justified. Less than 50 of the command's 245 fighters were serviceable when Kenny arrived to take over, and half of the bombers were grounded for repairs because spare parts never arrived. Immediately he issued orders halting the scrapping of planes. They were to be rebuilt, even if nothing is left but a tailwheel, from salvaged parts, and tin cans were to be beaten flat to patch up bullet holes. After a few weeks of effective maintenance, the number of aircraft available for operations was doubled. Kenny now set about putting them to good effect by ordering a massive raid on Rabool. When MacArthur's egotistical chief of staff, General Sutherland, who was referred to as the General's Rasputin, tried to revise the plan, Kenny stormed into Sutherland's office for a showdown. Putting a pencil dot on a large piece of blank paper on the general's tidy desk, he declared angrily, That is what you know about air power. The rest of the sheet is what. I know about it, suggesting that if the chief of staff disagreed, they should go into the supreme commander's office next door to see who is supposed to run this air force. The success of the subsequent raid on Rabaul convinced MacArthur that air power, in the form of what was to become the 5th Air Force, could play a key part in reviving his stalled campaign in New Guinea by a bombing offensive against the Japanese bases in northern Papua, as well as by harrying the enemy advance up the Owen Stanleys. At the same time, the transports were dropping supplies to the Australian soldiers labouring up the Kokoda Trail from Port Moresby. Across the Western Pacific in New Zealand, Admiral Gormley's staff were sweating aboard his headquarters ship Argonne in Auckland Harbour,
trying to get Operation Watchtower launched. The five weeks they had been given proved too little time to assemble all the troops, shipping and equipment, even though the landing force had been reduced to a single marine division, because the 3rd Army Infantry Division, which had been undergoing amphibious training on the west coast, was already on its way to the Atlantic ports for embarkation for North Africa. Major General Alexander Vandergrift, who confessed he didn't even know the location of Guadalcanal, faced a tough assignment getting his 1st Marine Division assembled in New Zealand. It was scattered over Hell's Half Acre when he arrived to prepare for the invasion with Admiral Turner. The Marines, who were recalled from San Francisco to New Caledonia, thought they were destined for some tropical paradise. The South Pacific Command Staff were not much wiser, relying on information they had gleaned from old National Geographic magazines and German charts of World War I vintage. Teams of intelligence officers were combing Australia to interview missionaries, sea captains and copra planters who were familiar with the Solomons. Their reports of the malarial jungles of the island chain and its scattered dark-skinned Melanesian natives caused Vandergrift to begin referring to Watchtower as Operation Pestilence. Lying in the torrid latitudes just south of the equator, the double chain of islands proved far removed from the palm-fringed tropical haven the marines were expecting. Discovered in the 16th century by Spanish adventurers searching for the legendary Ophir of King Solomon, Guadalcanal was one of the largest in the group. A hundred miles long by fifty miles at the widest, it was shrouded in a dense vegetation that thrived on the heavy rainfall from dense clouds trapped by a mountain backbone 8,000 feet high. Except where the lower slopes opened on meadows of razor-sharp kunai grass, the tropical vegetation was so dense that little sunlight penetrated into the tangled undergrowth, where white cockatoos and minor birds screeched through the green twilight. A rich variety of tropical insect life grew bloated on the rotting vegetation that sent a heavy stench of decay drifting out across the indispensable strait to Florida Island, where the tiny islet of Tulagi nestled in its bite. Lacking the dense jungle and swamps of its bigger neighbours, Tulagi was one of the few islands considered healthy enough for the white settlers and administrators who managed the copra plantations and governed the Solomon's scattered territory from a one-street town of bungalows that boasted the indispensable symbol of British colonialism, a cricket pitch. Since May 5, the rising sun had been flying from the flagstaff, where for nearly a hundred years the Union Jack had been daily raised. A garrison of two, three and so on, Imperial Navy Marines of the Special Naval Landing Force guarded the town and the two adjoining islets where Kawanshi seaplanes took off on patrol. By the beginning of July, they had been joined by 1,400 men of the Imperial Navy's Airfield Construction Unit, who were ferried each morning across the Sound to Guadalcanal to build the new base for the planes of the Navy's 25th Air Flotilla. The Japanese command in Rabul waited impatiently for the airstrip to be completed, so as to consolidate their hold on the Solomons. By the end of the month, the construction crews had carved out a runway on Guadalcanal through the Kunai grass fields west of the mouth of the Lunga River. A rudimentary control tower and camp was being raised among the coconut palms. In Wellington, a New Zealand dock strike forced the Marines to reload their transport ships. All their supplies and equipment had been improperly loaded on the west coast. The driving winter rains burst open many of the cardboard ration containers, leaving the quayside ankle-deep in a soggy brown mush of cornflakes and cigarette cartons. The foul-up gave Admiral Gormley the extra week's delay he needed before the landings to obtain detailed photo reconnaissance of the Japanese airfield and the nearby beach at Lunga Point, where most of the Marines were scheduled to come ashore. With three weeks still to go before the revised D-Day date of August 7, 1942, he issued his final watchtower plan. Admiral Turner would be in command of the 19 transports carrying in two combat teams of the 1st Marine Division. The transports would be escorted into the two landing areas off Tulagi and Guadalcanal by four destroyers, while a force of three cruisers and six destroyers bombarded the enemy. Standing close guard over the landings would be MacArthur's Navy, the three Australian cruisers and five destroyers under Rear Admiral Sir Victor Crutchley, reinforced by the heavy cruiser USS Chicago and four Pacific Fleet destroyers.
A formidable umbrella of air cover was to be provided by three of Nimitz's four carrier task forces, reinforced for the first time by the 16-inch guns of the new fast battleship North Carolina. Operation Watchtower was a hastily improvised amphibious assault, which would not have stood much chance had it been going in against well-defended enemy positions. Even its commanders would derisively refer to it as Operation Shoestring, a name that was to prove only too accurate when its amphibious forces assembled together for dress rehearsal off Fiji on July 26. The final staff conference was treated to much table-thumping from Vandergrift and Turner, who were determined to get the invasion organised in the final 48 hours. The practice proved a complete bust, and the 19 transports set sail escorted by 43 warships on the last day of July, with the commanders praying that the old adage, a poor rehearsal means a good first night, was not just a theatrical myth. The opening night for the United States Navy's first amphibious assault of the Pacific campaign came at midnight on August 6. The shadowy columns of Admiral Turner's invasion force swung around Guadalcanal's Cape Esperance and into the dark sound, past the volcanic sentinel of Savo toward Tulagi and the islets rearing up from the ebony waters like giant whales. The marines, who had come up on deck abandoning crap games, jitterbugging and prayers, smelled the stench of decaying vegetation that drifted across the waters, a sickening odour they would soon come to identify as the smell of death itself. Breakfast, for those who could stomach it, was piped for 4.30 as the armada divided in two. The bombarding warships of the X-ray force were to glide through the still water toward Florida Island, while the yoke force of 11 transports and the heavy cruisers crept along the Guadalcanal shoreline toward Lunga Point. Everyone seemed ready to jump at the first boom of a gun, but there was little excitement, noted an American journalist, Richard Tregaskis, who at 26 was covering his first war assignment from the deck of one of the Tulagi-bound transports. The thing that was happening was so unbelievable that it seemed like a dream. We were slipping through the narrow neck of water between Guadalcanal and Savo Islands. We were practically inside Tulagi Bay, almost past the Japanese shore batteries, and not a shot had been fired. Japan's intelligence had once again failed utterly to give any advance warning of the American operation about to hit the Solomons. It was not until dawn silhouetted the approaching warships that the lookouts on Tulagi awoke to their doom. A radio operator tapped out an uncertain signal to Rabul. Large force of ships, unknown number or types, entering sound, what can they be? Seconds later, at 6.13am, the answer thundered from the nine eight-inch guns of the heavy cruiser Quincy leading the Y-Force, which sent her first salvo crashing down east of Lunga Point, where 5,000 Japanese troops were thought to be dug into defences. Another bombardment echoed from the X-ray warships across the sound. Enemy force overwhelming, the Tulagi commander radioed at 6.30am. We will defend our posts to the death. It was his last message. Seconds later, shells from the warships destroyed the transmitting station. The first of the American carrier strikes roared in to join the battle, the dive bombers making flaming torches of the Japanese flying boats as they tried to scramble into the air. Wizard Kalu Calais, oh what a day! Australian coast watcher Captain W.F. Martin Clemens recorded in his diary for the morning when he awoke to the distant rumble of guns and the appearance of RAF Hudsons droning overhead. He was writing from a carefully camouflaged hideout deep in the jungle slopes of Guadalcanal, and the morale of his native scouts went soaring up 500% as Clemens tuned into his shortwave radio to listen in rapture to the American fighter pilot's messages. The sea and air bombardment reached an ear-splitting crescendo around 7 o'clock as the transports ranged up 1,000 yards from the two assault areas. The stubby landing craft were lowered, Heavy hemp nets unrolled, and the burdened marines began scrambling down to make the tricky leap onto the bobbing decks, heaving in four-foot swells. Ant-like they went over the side, clinging to the rough rope nets that swayed out and in against the warm steel sides of the ships, recalled machine gunner Private Robert H. Lecky. They stepped on the fingers of the man below and felt their own hands squashed by the men above. Rifles clanged against helmets, Men carrying heavy machine guns or mortars ground their teeth in the agony of descending into the waiting boats 
with thirty and forty pounds of steel boring into their shoulders, and the boats rose and fell in the swells, now close to the ship's sides, now three feet away. The men jumped, landing in clanging heaps, then crouched beneath gunwales while the loaded boats churned to the assembly areas, forming rings and circling, finally fanning out in a broad line a few minutes before eight, and speeding with hulls down and frothing wake straight for the shores of the enemy. For all the chaos of the rehearsal, the actual landings proved to be a happy anticlimax. More marines were injured by sharp coral heads as they waded up the dun-coloured beach than by enemy bullets. The sheer weight of the bombardment had forced the enemy to take cover inland. By 8.15 the first wave of the assault was ashore on Red Beach to Largi, signalling, landing successful no opposition, as the boats churned off to bring the next companies into Blue Beach. Colonel Merritt A. Edson, whose 2nd Raider Battalion spearheaded the attack, was in control of the small town by late morning. But that afternoon he found that the enemy had holed up in the hills at the eastern end of the small island overlooking the open cricket ground. At night the Japanese marines crawled out to deliver a fierce counterattack before being beaten back. The Nips had two hundred men in dugouts and rock emplacements, with snipers scattered around, Edson reported of the fanatical resistance. It was to take another day's hand-to-hand -hand fighting to subdue the tiny island, a portent of how tough it was going to be to defeat Japan's soldiers, who carried out literally their orders to defend our posts to the death. Even after we got control, Edson recounted, machine gun nests in dugouts held up our advance for several hours. It was impossible to approach the nip dugouts except from one direction. You had to crawl up on the cliffs and drop dynamite inside while you were under fire all the time. The raiders were shaken by this first facet-to-face lesson in the warrior code of Bushido, as the Japanese held out in caves without food, water or hope, refusing to surrender. Of nearly 2,000 defenders, only 23 were taken prisoner alive. Not one surrendered voluntarily in the three days of fighting that cost the marines 100 dead. Across the sound at Guadalcanal's Red Beach, five miles east of the partly finished airstrip at Lunga Point, the first two marine battalions had landed without firing a single shot. The Japanese construction parties had no weapons. They fled into the jungle, abandoning their rice breakfasts, which the advancing marines found still warm on the tables of the partially completed mess hut. The runway was three quarters finished, the control tower was up, and the electric generator plant working. A bulldozer, construction equipment and building materials were abandoned intact, so was what would prove to be the biggest prize of all, a small mountain of food supplies. The many tons of rice and soybeans were of less immediate interest that hot day to the thirsty marines than hundreds of cases of Japanese beer and the refrigeration plant, which was labelled by its grateful discoverers Toyo Ice Factory under new management. The very success of the Marines' landing brought its own dangers. By noon on the first day, men and supplies were being piled up on the beaches faster than they could be moved ashore, making the landing dangerously vulnerable to air attack. However, the Japanese command at Rabul was too taken by surprise to seize the opportunity for counter-attacking. Admiral Mikawa's bombers were about to take off for another raid in support of the troops advancing across Papua, and valuable hours were lost before they could rearm with torpedoes to strike the Guadalcanal transports. His cruiser force, too, was scattered, covering convoys carrying reinforcements to Buna and the bases in the Louisiades. In response to Admiral Yamamoto's urgent orders to repel the American landings with his sea and air forces, Mikawa boarded the Chokai to lead his squadron of five heavy and two light cruisers in the first bid to retake the Guadalcanal base. Racing southwest past Bougainville that evening, it became apparent to Mikawa that the force of 500 Imperial Navy Marines, following behind in two transports, would be hopelessly inadequate for the task. The transports were ordered to return to Rabul. That afternoon, his pilots managed to press their attack home, despite the heavy fighter cover from the American carrier task forces south of the island, to sink a transport and damage a destroyer that would eventually have to be scuttled. The increasing severity of the bombing raids the next morning caused Turner to order a speeding up of unloading operations, as reports came in from coast watchers and air patrols that a cruiser force was bearing down on him.
At 11.17 on the second day of Watchtower, Mikawa's squadron was lost. The Navy PBYs and Australian Hudsons and 5th Air Force B-17s, pilots had failed to appreciate that the Japanese were speeding along the channel that separated the outer islands of Choiseul and Santa Isabel from the sprawl of New Georgia, the most direct route to Guadalcanal, which would become known tersely as the Slot. The failure of the intensive air reconnaissance to locate the enemy cruisers before dusk was to open the way to a disaster. Rochefort's codebreakers at Pearl Harbor were taking two weeks to unravel the new Japanese operational cipher and Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet Intelligence, which was relying on traffic analysis, could offer no indication of the force's whereabouts because it was observing radio silence. This led Admiral Turner to conclude early in the evening of August 8 that the Japanese cruisers were too far away to present a threat to his highly vulnerable transports until the next day. His more immediate worry was the decision taken by Admiral Fletcher that afternoon to pull out with his covering task force, after losing a fifth of his fighters in beating off two heavy Japanese raids. Citing his usual concern about lack of fuel and his weakened defences, in view of the large numbers of enemy torpedo bombers, Fletcher signalled Admiral Gormley, Recommend immediate withdrawal of my carriers. Without waiting for confirmation, he was withdrawing to the south and well out of range of Guadalcanal by 8pm when Turner's commanders assembled on his headquarters ship Macaulay, a transport whose crew fondly called her Wacky Mac. The humid night added to the sense of crisis as the amphibious force commander announced his stunning decision. The departure of the carrier air umbrella obliged him also to withdraw the transports and cruisers early next day. General Vandergrift protested this running away, but Turner believed he had no option if he wanted to save his ships from being sunk by the Japanese bombers. Harsh words were exchanged in a tense meeting that lasted until midnight. As the conference broke up and Admiral Crutchley's barge came alongside to take him to where the cruiser Australia lay at anchor, lightning was flickering around the dark mountain peaks of Guadalcanal. Crutchley's flagship was more than 30 miles south of the entrance to the Sound, where his four cruisers were steaming routine box patrols, while two destroyers stood advanced picket guard south of Savo Island. Neither their lookouts nor radar had spotted the float plane that had been flown off by Admiral Mikawa's approaching cruisers. May each man do his utmost, the Japanese admiral had paraphrased Nelson. His force ran at high speed toward the entrance to the Sound, high in the expectation that the Imperial Navy's expertise in night attacks would deliver them certain victory. Every gun was now trained silently on the distant, dim silhouette of the destroyer USS Blue, which astonishingly reversed course after failing to spot them in the velvet blackness of the moonless night. Mikawa had penetrated two miles south of Savo at 1.42, before the more alert lookouts aboard the Patterson signalled, Warning, warning, strange ships entering harbour. It was another five minutes before the Japanese, without benefit of radar, realised there were two cruisers dead ahead. Swinging out to the north to cross their T, the action began with the Chokai's float plane overhead, dropping green-hued flares. Searchlights blazed, illuminating HMS Canberra and USS Chicago, caught at point-blank three-mile range with their gun crews unprepared. Before they could get off a single salvo, the Australian cruiser was pounded into a blazing wreck at the receiving end of 24 shells. The Chicago was hit by a torpedo and charged out of the battle, mistakenly chasing one of her own destroyers north. This manoeuvre around Savo in two columns brought the Japanese force into a head-on collision with the second patrol of three cruisers. The sternmost, the lightly armoured USS Astoria, succumbed to repeated hits from the enemy's eight-inch armour-piercing shells. Engulfed in shellfire, the USS Quincy was the only Allied ship whose gun crews got into action fast enough to hit back with a few salvos, one of which damaged the Chokai. The odds were pitifully unequal. Suddenly the ship shook violently and literally leapt out of the ocean, was the graphic recollection of one survivor on board the Quincy as two torpedoes hit and her forward magazines blew up. The sound of breaking glass, of steel hitting steel, the hissing of air from the compressed airlines, the explosion of countless shells and the pitiful cries of the wounded all merged into one and seemed to shout the doom of the Quincy.
She was already sinking when the USS Vincennes at the head of the column was repeatedly hit, surviving a little longer before being blasted out of the water on both quarters as Mikawa swung his two columns north out of the sound to regroup. Admiral Crutchley was still racing up in the Australia, but his cruiser arrived on the battle scene after the half-hour's action was over. With one cruiser sunk and three blazing wrecks, he could only rescue the stunned survivors. Mikawa had by now decided to abandon his original intention of going back into the sound to sink the transports, which had only the Australia and a handful of destroyers to protect them. Had he seized the initiative, Operation Watchtower would have collapsed, and with it the American Solomon's offensive. The Japanese Admiral's decision to withdraw after winning the Battle of Savo Island saved Guadalcanal from being added to the long list of Allied disasters. Mikawa did not yet know that the American carriers had withdrawn. In fact, he would not have encountered air attacks had he stayed until dawn to smash up the invasion beachhead. The Marines were saved, but the United States Navy had suffered the worst sea defeat in its entire history.